Welcome everyone to ASNEA Network Storage Forum uh, talk. Uh, we're continuing our series of uh, discussions about data processing units um, with an introduction and overview of the Open Programmable Infrastructure Project, which is um, going to be presented uh, by the working group uh, leaders from our project. So I'm Joseph White. I'm a fellow with Dell who, and the OPI TSC chair. Uh, Paul Pendell is a principal architect working on business development, overseeing technical aspects of partner solutions. And he's our outreach uh, working group leader. Boris Glimcher is a distinguished engineer for Dell who's working on DPUs and storage. And he's the OPI lifecycle and provisioning working group leader. Uh, Mark Sanders is another distinguished engineer from Dell working on DPUs as well as security, and he's the API working group leader, uh, but unfortunately he will not be with us today uh, due to the storm that blanketed uh, a large section of the U.S. with snow. He lost uh, internet and power. Um, so uh, Boris will be talking about uh, APIs as well as lifecycle and provisioning. Uh, Stephen Royer is a principal software engineer at Red Hat and the Emerging Technology Group uh, focusing on computational infrastructure. And he's our uh, POC and developer platform working group leader. Uh, Alad Blot is the global head of telco networking of NVIDIA, and he's our use case working group leader. Um, So a little bit about SNEA. I'm sure many of you are repeat customers, but I'll just reinforce that SNEA is a uh, very large organization with uh, 180 organizations members, and we have about 2,500 people who contribute and a very large number of end users. Uh, we just went through 25th anniversary with SNEA, and it's grown up from being just about you know, how do you connect um, storage to each other and storage to basically servers uh, to covering all aspects of server storage and networking. Um, and we have, as I said, we have a very diverse set of activities. Um, legal disclaimer, the key here is that, you know, this is educational and informative. Uh, no warranties are imp implied. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is each of the working groups I introduced earlier. Um, and uh, we'll take questions. So just type the questions in the question interface. Um, and we may answer some as we go, but definitely we'll have time uh, at the end for Q&A. Um, if you want to access the presentation itself, there's a uh, tab, uh, attachment tab where you can uh, grab that. And with that, I will turn it over to Paul to give an overall introduction to OPI. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Again, my name is Paul Pendell. I work for F5. Um, been working with several of the companies uh, uh, that are members of the OPI project, the Open Programmable Infrastructure Project, for going on close to, to two years now. And it's been um, in the last six to nine months that we've joined the Linux Foundation as a project. Uh, so our project is hosted as a foundation under the Linux Foundation. Um, our goal is around DPU and IPU related uh, technologies. So we are trying to come up with an open ecosystem where we can drive uh, some standards and come up with those standards a way that multiple vendors, DPUs or IPUs can be provisioned or accessed, managed, uh, deployed upon in a common, common way uh, so we can avoid some of the problems that have happened in, in other technologies like this, where there's a vendor lock-in or a vendor SDK that is uh, 
different from all of the others or drivers that are different from all of the others. We want a, a common way to deal with those things. You can find us on the web at opiproject.org uh, or on GitHub, github forward slash OPI project. And you can join our lists. And this is where we keep a, a, a running tab of the calendar entries. So when our working group meetings meet, when our TSC meets, uh, those sorts of meetings are all available at the lists.opiproject.org. And you can see that link here. So as of today, we have um, these premier members. Um, and you can see we have nine of them. We have a 10th one that's on the way. We're waiting for a couple of signatures. So they didn't make it to the slide this morning. But we've got Dell, F5, Intel, Keysight, Marvell, NVIDIA, Red Hat, Tencent, and ZTE. Each of these companies has uh, representatives on the board and a representative on the outreach committee and on the TSC. We have three general members, Dream Big, Solid Run, and Unifabrics. Uh, as a class, they all have a, uh, they've elected a member to be uh, on, uh, on the TSC and in the outreach committee. So those are the who, the what that we're doing is we are, we've decided and we're defining a DPU IP like device that has a trust line at the PCIe bus. And this is for a card. Let's assume it's a card at this point. It does not have to be a card. Uh, but today we're, we're going to talk about cards. So within a physical system, the trust line is where the PCIe bus is. And we can create two different uh, areas, workloads up above and infrastructure down below. So again, we're trying to create standards for DPU, IPU technologies. And we're, we're going to come up with uh, labs in which we can test this, uh, APIs that are used uh, as these common interfaces, and um, example um, examples on how to use these. And each of the work group leaders here will be talking about those. And with that, I want to pass it off to Boris. Boris, lifecycle pro provisioning, it's all yours. Thank you, Paul. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Boris Glimcher. I'm the Distinguished Engineer at Dell. And uh, today I'll present you the um, well, technical working group on lifecycle provisioning in OPI. So first, let's see what the focus areas of our work group uh, are. So first of all, we're focusing on the provisioning of the DPU and IPO like devices. Uh, we also focus on the inventory collection from those DPU and IPU devices. We look in at boot sequencing. If DPU and IPU cards are inserted in the server, uh, how the boot sequencing between the DPU and IPU cards and the server itself looks like. We're looking at lifecycle management, uh, software, firmware, um, application upgrades, reboots, factory resets, stuff like that. And we're looking at monitoring and telemetry in a common way across all the vendors. Um, on the next slides, I'm going to have a little bit more deep dive on each and every of those five uh, uh, focus areas. Uh, but before we jump into that, uh, our main repository on GitHub is OPI Provisioning Lifecycle. From there, you can find all the links for, for the five focus areas with a detailed documentation and the current status of what we're doing. And if you want to ask questions, you can join our Slack channel, we have a Slack channel for this group. Okay, let's dive uh, a little bit deeper. Provisioning. So our customers and partners came up with a problem that we're trying to solve is how we provision the DPU and IPO-like devices. We looked at a lot of standards, we compared all of them, and we finally uh, decided to vote and adopt the RFC A572, which is secure zero-touch provisioning. Uh, it doesn't only apply to DPUs and APUs, uh, it can be applied to uh, any devices. Uh, but for us in you know, OPI, the focus is DPUs and APUs, so we adopted that standard. Basically, if you're familiar with a standard or classic uh, zero touch provisioning, I'm not going to repeat that uh, much, but you can see that usually you have uh, your DHCP server, your Pixie server, your file server, and then you serve your files um, to your device. 
the security or touch provisioning RFC adds additional entity into the consideration, which is called bootstrap server. So with addition of bootstrap server, we can do a zero touch provisioning in a secure way. Uh, the key point here is uh, everything is automated. The DPUs and IPUs onboard themselves in the network. So there is no manual uh, or administrative intervention in that process. So why we chose secure zero touch provisioning for three security considerations. First of all, if DPUs are shipped to a customers and um, installed in their network, first of all, DPU have to be validated by the network. Um, it have to be authentic device uh, that claims um, that what it is from trusted source um, and so on. So the first consideration is the network have to validate DPU. The second consideration is the DPU have to validate network. And this is for stolen devices or wrong phone shipment to uh, different customers. So DPU have to know which network it's being installed in and val validate that the network is authentic. And the last consideration, any artifact the Bootstrap server offers like OS images, configuration files, or anything like that have to be cryptographically signed. So all those three consideration made us um, um, vote and adopt RFC 8572. 8572 um, relies on two auxiliary RFCs. Uh, one is uh, from IEEE, uh, 805.1 AR, Secure Device Identity. And the second one is RFC 8366, a voucher artifact for Bluetooth protocols. Uh, all those auxiliary RFCs uh, together with RFC 8572 those are make uh, the complete solution for the DPU and IPU like devices in the cloud. Um, in addition to adopting the standard, we decided to actually implement the secure zero touch provisioning uh, client or agent that runs inside the DPUs and IPUs. And you can see our implementation uh, on GitHub. I posted here the link for you to check it out. Um, so switching gears, to the next uh, focus areas. The next one is inventory. So from inventory perspective, we looked at different standards. Uh, how can we actually collect the inventory uh, in a vendor agnostic way from all the DPU and IPU like devices? Um, we identify three uh, areas of interest. First one is local inventory, which means applications that running inside the DPU and IPU need to access inventory information locally. Um, the second area is remote network inventory. How outside applications over the network can query DPUs and IPUs and fetch the uh, network inventory information. And the third one is if DPUs and APUs are inserted in a server, how the server operating system or the board management controller can access the inventory information from DPUs and APUs. Um, so we developed all those three areas in parallel. The first one uh, was pretty straightforward. Um, from DMTF, there is a, a SMBIOS spec that um, kind of standard today across the servers. Uh, we looked into that, we tested it on different DPUs and APUs, and it looked a great fit for uh, us to adopt that. So DMI SMBIO standard from DMTF is official standard that we voted on in DPUs and APUs. You can see on the right, the example um, from the MID code uh, utility uh, in Linux running inside the DPUs and APUs. Specifically here, example is from NVIDIA Bluefield card. Uh, and you can see a different system information, uh, which is DMI type one, uh, just as an example. In order to test compliance for OPI, uh, since we are uh, also a standard, um, we are uh, developing the SMBIOS validation tool. You can find it on GitHub as well. And this repository helps us to run on every single DPU and IPU and uh, raise exceptions and test the compliance with uh, OPI spec, uh, which is basically a subset of a DMTF uh, SMBIOS spec which is relevant for DPUs and APUs, um, and some tables are irrelevant and more relevant to the chassis and server. On the remote network inventory, we're looking into two um, 
possible implementations. One is a DMTF Redfish standard, which is a standard across uh, the servers today. Uh, but also we received a lot of requests to implement the gRPC-based protocol, Google protocol buffers-based um, inventory query. So we went ahead and implement OPI SMBIOS bridge, which is a Docker container with uh, SMBIOS uh, uh, bridge implementation. So you can send a single query over gRPC uh, to DPUs and APUs, and you will receive exactly the same DMI SMBIOS information over gRPC with a single query, uh, which I think is very valuable. On the remote host OS and BMC, uh, we didn't make much progress so far. So we're looking into NCSI standards, PLDM, VPD, and others. Switching gears uh, for boot sequencing. For boot sequencing, um, basically, uh, it's only relevant if the DPUs and APUs are part of the server and not standalone. When DPUs and APUs are part of the server, uh, we uh, understand the need to coordinate the boot between the server itself and the DPU parts. As long as server uh, receives power, DPUs and APUs immediately start booting themselves, and server also starts booting independently. So we feel the need to coordinate the boot. So we feel that the host should be halted until DPU uh, completes booting, and then there is a communication from DPU to the host to release hold or continue booting so some kind of boot complete notification uh, and we do uh, want to implement the timeout mechanism if that such notification never arises. Uh, another boot sequencing consideration is dpu reboot so what happens during the dpu reboot today with pci express cards when the card is being uh, rebooted uh, there is a downpouring containment hot plug uh, or surprise removal events uh, which causes a lot of issues on different platforms, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Linux is much better, but the Windows uh, VMware environments have a lot of issues with hot plug and surprise removal. So we feel there is some kind of notification that needed from the DPU towards the host that the reboot is going to happen. So the host can prepare itself for the PCI Express uh, card uh, unplug uh, and uh, replug again. Uh, host reboot is another issue that we see currently. So what happens if the host uh, wants to reboot itself? Um, DPU would like to receive the notification from the host. For example, there are resources that can be allocated inside DPUs and APUs uh, for each and every host. So the DPU would like to release those or free those resources. So we would like to have another uh, notification in the other direction. And crashes, uh, the last but not the least, Obviously, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, kernel here. A DPU can panic. Uh, what happens during that time? Uh, there is no responsiveness uh, during that time. So we need to de deal with that uh, issue as well. So this is another work stream in our subgroup, technical working group that we are focusing on. Switching gears to another topic, which is LCM, lifecycle management. We identify uh, four major actions that we need to perform on the DPUs and IP devices, and we're looking into how exactly to implement and what is the best standard to do so. So first of all, we need a way to reboot the DPU, and we have a lot of different types of reboot, whether it's firmware reboot, the OS reboot, or some application that needs a restart. We're looking into updates, and also here we have the update of the DPU firmware, DPU OS and bootloaders, or DPU software or applications. We also need a, a way to recover DPU to a known state. Um, many of you know that as kind of factory reset operation, and we want to be able to issue that factory reset uh, from the network and from the host if DPU is an add-on card in the host. And also the debugging of the DPU is a major problem today. So we feel a need in this work stream to solve that uh, as well. Moving on, uh, monitoring and telemetry. So um, in OPI, in our technical work group, we adopted OTEL standard, open telemetry. 
Uh, Open Telemetry, as you know, was created uh, by joining two projects. One is focusing on metrics, one is focusing on traces. So we um, felt this is the best course of action to vote and adopt Open Telemetry OTEL standard. Um, we are focusing on traces, metrics, and logs. Uh, we want to stream in the same uh, way, in the same uh, models, the traces, metrics, and logs from all the DPUs um, in a vendor agnostic way to the centralized location when we can then present them with the usual um, traces, metrics, tools uh, like Prometheus, uh, Grafana, uh, and others, uh, Jaeger, Zipkin, and other tools. Uh, in order to um, show how it's implemented, we created an example open telemetry collector uh, integrated with SPDK and system monitoring. SPDK for storage, we'll talk a little bit about that in the next uh, slides on API, and system monitoring for CPU network functions, uh, memory, local drive, and other. So you can follow the example here in this GitHub repository. Uh, our recommended open telemetry collector deploy option is on every DPU uh, as close as possible to the data generation. We want to deploy the small open telemetry collector and then a macro or a gateway aggregator collector will be outside of DPUs that will collect all the data from all the DPUs and APUs in a centralized location. And this is uh, to increase redundancy, to do the um, telemetry enrichment, filtering, batching and sanitization. So that concludes my section, lifecycle and provisioning workgroup. Hey, Boris, before we move on to the API section, we had a question about OCP um, uh, Calyptra um, for silicon level hardware authentication during boot and uh, involves root of trust as well. And um, our, my preliminary answer to that is we haven't really looked at it in detail, but I don't know if you have any amplification and we but we will i don't know if you have any application boris amplification of that boris um yeah uh, thank you for your question i haven't looked in calyptra myself so thank you for that uh, point i will try and uh, read about it but we follow the root of trust and secure standards from ieee so that will be part of the secure zero touch provisioning that we're looking at Yeah, and we will look at the, so again, um, for uh, some forms of uh, boot, we've looked a little bit at the uh, UFI standards uh, and we'll continue to do so. That's an excellent question as well. And then um, on the... Yes, UFI is absolutely the way that we look at this uh, for sure. If we can create the standard or adopt the standard, from UFI, that's exactly our thinking. Um, this is from the sequencing perspective, but from the reboots, um, um, uh, we work with uh, other, um, like PC Express SIG, uh, to find out how can we solve the surprise removal hot plug events and stuff like that. And we are looking at, uh, oh, so the next question, Boris, is on testing. Um, Somebody was saying when they were testing NVIDIA DPUs, they were looking for temperature because, you know, that sort of uh, physical sensor is important. And maybe you want to just quickly answer that and then we'll move to API and answer any other questions at the end if we have time. Mm -hmm. so um, I guess the answer, read it quickly. Yeah. yeah, I guess the answer yeah. is we'll look at, you know, we are looking at uh, physical card information and sensor information. Yeah, so first of all, there are a lot of uh, standards uh, to read the sensor from the DPU card itself. Uh, um, this is uh, standards that are uh, not created for specifically DPUs and APUs. We use exactly the same standards when we talk about uh, standard NIC cards, for example. So the same uh, communication port, same physical interfaces applied here, whether it's a uh, PLDM or NCSI or I2C buses uh, with different protocols on top of that. So for sure, we have the way to read sensors to the platform BMC, and then we can understand the cooling. We can see the entire picture from the server perspective. Um, 
So yes, server will know before the GPU itself knows because server has not a single sensor from the GPU, but the entire ecosystem of different sensors and temperature readings from all the different components in the server itself. So I don't feel the need for GPU to notify server because server will know first and then um, it will make decisions for the cooling and thermal and fan speed and all that stuff. Another question on CXL. Um, we definitely had a conversation internally about uh, CXL. Uh, we didn't uh, see um, the good uh, advancement uh, in the CXL area for DPs and APs yet. Uh, so we didn't reach actively to that consortium uh, from OPI itself. I know that vendors individually work with CXL, uh, but this is definitely on our to-do list. All right. Yeah, let's we'll take additional questions at the end. So let's move to the API section quickly. Sure. So um, as Joe updated, uh, Mark is uh, uh, unable to join today. So I'll try to cover his section. So uh, when creating the API work stream, uh, we were thinking about four major areas that we need to cover. Uh, one is storage. We see that a lot of DPUs and APU vendors looking into creating storage devices from DPUs and APUs towards the host if DPU is an add-on card in the server. And we see a lot of standards, Virtio uh, or NVMe, uh, devices being presented to the host. So we felt the need to create an API uh, to standardize how we manage those emulated Virtio and MVMe devices. Um, the second area is security. Uh, we'll touch base on security, but uh, uh, just an example, uh, IPsec. Um, uh, DPUs and APUs have an IPsec accelerator and we felt a need to standardize how security APIs are being uh, consumed uh, in a vendor agnostic way. The third bucket uh, is networking. Uh, all the DPUs and APUs are NICs first and then addition to NICs as well. So they all have some network functions or a lot of network functions. So standardizing on the network interfaces was really important to API work group. And the last one uh, is AI ML. Uh, in AI ML uh, workspace, we didn't make any progress yet, uh, but we are uh, always looking for contributions and more people coming and uh, contributing to OPI in that space as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about standardizing telemetry and system and lifecycle management on the previous section, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, our main repository for OPI is under OPI Project GitHub organization, OPI API. We have the uh, standard definitions uh, and a lot of documentation in that repository. And implementation wise, I will show you a few examples. Those are in different repositories. And if you have a question, join us on Slack. We have a separate channel for API one group. This is a high level um, block diagram, how our API mechanism look like. So uh, starting at the bottom and going up, uh, all the DPUs and APUs have hardware accelerators. Um, almost all of them are running Linux. And on top of that, uh, every single vendor has its own SDK uh, on top of that. And SDK either runs on top of Linux or can bypass Linux and have direct access to the hardware, which is a standard uh, uh, way of accessing the hardware bypassing Linux kernel. Nothing new here. On top of that, what we want to create, we want to create Shim API layer. And one for networking, one for storage, one for security, and one for AI ML. Uh, on top of that, optionally, we can deploy API gateway and load balancer. This is a standard solution uh, that we are not going to create, just a top. And um, 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 this is a way to load balance, uh, for example, different uh, APIs, uh, call, API calls that we're doing, but also to play, for example, from REST to GPC um, and similar way. 
Uh, we also want to connect the gateway of Balancer to authentication service and open telemetry collector as well. So we can uh, do the authentication authorization in a centralized a single place and not implement the same in each and every API layer. So the client will connect through the gateway with authorization and authentication. Uh, every API will be documented to the hotel um, and then it will go to the appropriate service. Uh, whether it's networking, storage security, or AIML. Uh, we did uh, choose a gRPC protocol on uh, top of Google Protobufs uh, for the config control phase. Um, so we, in order to configure networking, storage, security, or AIML, and in gRPC protobuf. Messages um, and getting those responses. Oh, that is cool. Let's deep dive a little bit uh, on each and every section. So, um, storage. So, for storage, we see a lot of vendors uh, are implementing emulated Virtio um, and NVMe standards towards the host if DPUs and APUs are a, a part of the server itself. Uh, is so we identify three uh, sets of APIs for storage. So one is front-end. Front-end meaning the host-facing APIs. For example, how we configure NVMe devices, Virtio Block, Virtio SCSI devices. For example, a HDP can present itself as a related uh, device on which physical function, virtual function, how many Q pairs, uh, what are the queue depths, maximum IO size, all that interface that is exposed to this host, uh, we call that front-end uh, set of APIs. Um, the back-end set of APIs are network-facing APIs. For example, we emulate NVMe device, but where we actually connect to the storage. Uh, so storage is usually a storage uh, array that is sitting on the network, and we connect it, for example, using NVMe over Fabric. RDMA, TCP, uh, or others. So those are uh, backend facing uh, or network facing APIs. Uh, the drives can be local or drives can be remote. ISCAS, RDMA, TCP, either IPv4 or IPv6. So all of that I refer to as backend APIs. So we need to provide like a triple of IP address for subsystem names, for example, if you want to connect to the remote and mini systems. So what's left is the middle end APIs, which is kind of APIs in between. So we have our backend remote devices, we have our front end emulated devices, and then we have something in the middle that can add additional value. For example, compression, right? You can do emulated device, then every IO will be compressed and then sent to the backend. So compression is a classic example of the middle end APIs. Same as encryption. Encryption is another example. Every IO have to be encrypted. So how we configure all those middle end services, this falls in the middle end set of APIs. We created the three reference implementation for storage. One is based on the open source project called uh, the SPDK. Probably uh, all of you familiar with that who comes from storage. Uh, so we have our gRPC protobuf APIs coming into uh, our Docker container, and we translate that to SPDK APIs, which are JSON RPC Unix domain socket based APIs. We also implemented two vendor specific bridges, one for Marvel and one for NVIDIA, uh, because the emulation part is not a standard and it's vendor specific. So we put this implementation on top of vendor SDK, as I showed on this slide. So this is our scheme interfaces for storage. Those are per, per vendor and maintained by the vendors. So Marvel NVIDIA and hopefully other DPU vendors will join in their bridges implementation as well. So we can send exactly the same uh, gRPC APIs across vendor implementation. This bridge will translate it to the vendor SDK and then uh, we will get exactly the same result from emulation uh, and storage perspective. Hope that was clear. The next bucket is networking APIs. So we wanted to create a common API framework and extension for three major areas, uh, just because our customers and partners identify those as important areas to tackle first. So we're looking at cloud, 
providers that come in and usually use gRPC APIs to configure uh, devices like DPUs and APUs. So we want to define a cloud-facing APIs. Uh, we're also um, looking in tel telco space and want to create the APIs for telco-specific usages. And we also identify that for Kubernetes specifically, uh, the networking part, the CNIs, are very important and we're looking into how exactly we can plug in into Kubernetes uh, world from DPUs and APUs project. Um, we want to support different network service capabilities, OBS, Sonic, BPP, and others. And we do want to leverage all the existing API models. So we're looking very closely at, at open config, OVSDB, different CNI implementations. Uh, the entire work is happening in the main repository in, under network, and we have a couple uh, pull request proposals for, for how uh, cloud and Kubernetes APIs should look like. Uh, next is security. For security, we're focusing on security offload, TLS and IPsec, crypto offload, secure storage key functions, policy and filters. So currently, we implemented the uh, bridge for StrongSwan uh, application, which is a standard application for IPsec tunneling. So we can run StrongSwan application inside DPUs and APUs. Uh, StrongSwan will use plugins to actually uh, implement per vendor its own hardware acceleration. So that's completely hidden from OPI and the user perspective. But what we did is using Vichy plugin, we implemented gRPC uh, uh, Pro Google protobuf definitions to the StrongSwan. So we can actually configure the StrongSwan application across different uh, DPU and IP vendors. If the vendor comes in and doesn't want to uh, run StrongSwan, that's completely fine as long as they're compliant with our defined security APIs for IPsec, for example. Um, so exactly the same gRPC protobuf commands can be uh, consumed. So from customer perspective, they are completely vendor agnostic in that space. So again, uh, check our implementation for the StrongSwan bridge. Uh, you can see a lot of documentation and examples how to actually use it. All our repositories have CI-CD pipelines and code coverage. So we are focusing on code first. Um, I can pass to Elad now for the use case group. Uh, if we have some questions in the chat, I can answer a few of those as well. Yeah, we have a question on a uh, trusted execution environment uh, oriented API. Um, so TEE, trusted execution environment. Uh, we didn't consider it yet, but thanks for the question. We can try to look into that. Yeah, I agree. And then we have uh, elaborate on the purpose of APIs for AI ML. Uh, AI ML is a recent addition. Uh, specifically, uh, the ask came from NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA has a, a strong uh, uh, interest in AI ML applications with GPUs and CUDA. So we felt a need to standardize or create an abstraction of how AI ML functions can be abstracted using the APIs. We didn't develop anything in that space yet. So um, again, looking for contribution in that space from the people who have uh, interest and knowledge how that would look like. There, there is a partner organization called I, uh, IOWN, ION, that is actually looking into that actively. They're combining DPUs, IPUs together with uh, GPUs and, and compute. And uh, the main use for their APIs there is to split the work uh, that uh, the AI needs between those three elements. So they get a stream in, for example, computer vision, they need to determine uh, which aspect of the system does what, hence they need an API to run uh, on the DPUs that is usually the pipeline. Right. Thanks yeah. a lot. It, yeah, perfect, perfect. And that's a great lead in and segue for your section. Thank you, Boris. So my name is Elab Blatt and I'm with NVIDIA and uh, I lead the use case group. And the use case group, if you think about what you've heard so far as sort of like our engineering and our smart people, uh, the use case group is sort of like our sales, uh, which means we like to talk. And what we do mostly is talk to end clients and deployment partners. And it's important to talk to them to understand what are their pain points, what are their fears, what are their 
uh, ideas of how to use DPUs, and this is exactly what we're doing. We're talking to these guys, we're talking company by company, uh, understanding the potential developments that they want to see, what deployments they want to see, what are the pain points that they see, and we encourage more and more end users to think about this and then to contribute, meaning give us feedback, say, this is what I would like to see, this is what I think is crucial, this is what I don't want to see, and so on. And it's helping us align to project goals because this project was created because of a demand from the field. Demand was democratize DPUs, IPUs. No more uh, segregation, right? No more separation between different OEMs. Let us do one thing that helps all of these deploy successfully. So by listening to you, by listening to the end clients, by understanding the demand and engaging uh, both on the POCs, both on the deployments, both on uh, just uh, any part of the project that you've heard so far, if it's the APIs provisioning, we'll talk about POC uh, soon. It's really helping us uh, not only build uh, the project goals in a tighter way, but also build something that you can actually use, that the end client can actually use and deploy. And of course, it's helping us build an open community uh, to include more and more members. As you've seen, we've already had uh, quite a selection of partners and we're welcoming more, uh, so please reach out. So what have we learned so far? I think there's, there's no uh, surprise here. You've heard uh, the recipe, if you will, but why did we come to this recipe? Because we've identified three main groups of features that kept on repeating in the conversations. Routing and switching, which is your OVS, your BGPs, your segment routing, in-cap, decap, VXLAN, and so on. Security, which was your WAFs, your next generation firewalls, IPsec, DDoS, IPS, IDS, and so on. Storage, uh, NVMe over Fabric, over TCP, RDMA, using SPDK, and so on. And we said, okay, if these are the more uh, general headlines, what are the actual use cases that we want to start with? And we decided to start with something which is very basic for each and every one. So for security, as you've heard from Boris, it's IPsec and the rule-based filtering. So just a basic firewall, which will grow eventually into a fully blown firewall. In storage, it's the NVMe PCIe to NVMe TCP bridge, as you've heard from Boris already. Again, he spoiled, he's taken, taken all my surprises away, he spoiled everything. But this is why we got to that, uh, to that point. We spoke to clients and we understood what, what they're looking to do. And of course, for routing is OVS on the one hand and Kubernetes networking on the other hand, which is becoming very popular. So really what we're asking and the call to action from my group is come and talk to us, set meetings, understand what we can do for you and what you can do for us, because this is really for the industry. Uh, and then let's talk about how do we give you tools? How do we give you partners that can help you deploy uh, seamlessly, no matter who you choose, server vendor, uh, IPU, DPU vendor, uh, or even a deployment environment, which is another conversation that we always have with our clients. How are you deploying? So this is uh, the high level concept of the use case group. And with that, I'll give it to Steven. All right, thanks, Zilad. Uh, so I'm Steve Royer from uh, the office of the CTO at Red Hat, and I lead the uh, proof of concept and developer platform group. Uh, so the, the main focus areas for the proof of concept group uh, right now is we put together a simulation environment um, so that you can try out the OPI software. If you are a uh, developer, you're looking to develop uh, an application to run in the, in the OPI uh, environment. Um, and you know, maybe you don't have all of the hardware available. You know, the simulation environment helps you get going with that. Um, the simulation environment um, is also our uh, developer platform and has become our CI as well. Uh, and so all of the, the things that you've seen talked about already, the APIs, um, the, the, the provisioning and lifecycle management, all of those um, pieces that um, many of them grew out of proof of concept and, and moved, graduated into their own repos, are now part of the CI. So as things change, um, we're, we're continuously testing that. Um, an, another big piece that we're, we're working on right now is a, a lab definition. So we're 
we're trying to build a lab um, using real hardware um, that we can then uh, extend our CI to run onto that environment. Um, we can use it for making sure that um, we're able to uh, correctly support you know, cross vendor uh, environments. And then uh, listed there is the, the, the repo for the, the proof of concept where all of this uh, discussion and development is happening. So next, I just wanted to give you a, a, an overview of the simulation environment. Uh, so there's all of those pieces that we've talked about um, are generally packaged up into individual as individual services into container images. Um, and then we can deploy those container images using Docker Compose that builds this whole environment. So it creates um, all of the different networks, which sort of simulate the, the kind of real world uh, environment that you have, where you have uh, your uh, infrastructure network is separate from your your tenant network is separate from you know uh, other networks um, and then we put all of the services uh, on the correct networks and then we have the ability to uh, run automated tests against all of these pieces together so you can just quickly and easily uh, spin up an environment um, without having any real uh, dpu or ipu hardware and then uh, run the tests yourself. Uh, you can add your own uh, your own new services, add your own tests, and uh, verify that everything works. Um, and then uh, lastly, we also have the ability to take um, pieces of this environment that, for example, would run on real hardware and run them on real hardware, so that you can have a, a hybrid environment where all of the infrastructure pieces um, we can have in the simulation environment and have it deploy um, just the uh, specific piece that you're trying to test on real hardware and have it connect all together. And that is uh, the simulation environment. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, so. I'll hand it back to Joe. Yeah, so would you like to join this project? Well, you can. Um, there are a variety of options within the Linux Foundation for, um, you know, formal participation levels. Informally, as individuals or as an organization, it's, you know, no cost. You can come join. Um, everything except for our board meetings is public. So all of the technical steering committee, all of the working group meetings are public. The outreach committee is public. We have a large amount of collateral, collateral available. There's a, a YouTube channel that's slowly uh, accumulating all of the things we've done over the last uh, six or eight months since we formed. Uh, we're very new, and uh, any so active contributions are extremely welcome. The questions that have been presented uh, are excellent, and again, if you're an expert in that area and you want to come contribute to uh, making DPUs uh part of an even more open ecosystem, uh, we'd love to have you. We have mailing list. We have a Slack channel, again, open to join. Um, and, you know, if you want to up your formal participation, you can get in touch with uh, Linux Foundation and they'll happily, um, you know, integrate you in. Um, so we have a few minutes for Q&A, but let me finish up the uh, you know, formal stuff first. Um, so please rate this feed, this podcast. It helps us with feedback. It helps us with uh, guiding content. Um, the slides are available in the button uh, on your interface or in the state educational library. Um, we'll post a blog with the Q&A and you can follow the SNEA Network Storage Forum uh, on Twitter. With that, we had one more question come in, which is, will OPI add APIs for less common use cases like hypervisor offload, application verification, video streaming, storage virtualization, time synchronization, et cetera? So the short answer is we're willing, we're absolutely willing to consider all those use cases. We have uh, discussed uh, aspects of them. Um, 
the uh, it, so some of them uh, either have other SDOs that are involved or um, get complicated. I don't know if any of my you know uh, fellow uh, working group chairs would like to contribute to that answer. Sure, uh, I, I think. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Boris, go first. Uh, I wanted. Yeah, I wanted to drop it to a lot. So I think that uh, as a use case chair, a lot uh, tries to prioritize for us technical uh, leads to focus on something. So if a, a use case group will identify those use cases are uh, as a priority, definitely, absolutely, we're going to focus and develop those APIs, whether by adopting an existing standards. Uh, modifying and expanding them for DPU and APU use cases, or if the standard doesn't exist, we can create one for ourselves. Uh, if you are an expert in this space, the person who asked the question, come in, join, and propose APIs, we'll definitely be willing to listen to that. Go ahead. So we definitely heard some of these before. I mean, I think uh, you, you product, whomever asked the question, product uh, pro prioritizes it very well. We do uh, see a lot of hypervisor offload questions, application verification, and, and even time synchronizations. And it came up, uh, but it didn't come up enough, meaning that in the priority, it just got a lower priority. We will probably get to most of these. I mean, uh, just as an example, timing prioritization with PTP4L, PTP4U is pretty straightforward. So we would, we would envision this being not a heavy lift at all, but uh, it did come up lower in the priority, hence, it's on the roadmap, but not high priority. Yeah, we're 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 trying we're working towards, you know, what can we actually deliver first that adds value and is useful to the DPU vendors, the you know integrator software providers, as well as the customers. So, um, and you know, we anticipate DPUs being around for a very long time, and we want to build a good you know, foundation as we've described here. And then a, a, there are a lot of use cases that could stand to have open source efforts or common definitions and aspects of how the DPUs operate. You know, there's a lot of benefits for making um, many aspects of it in common. So any other questions, type them in. Okay. Any uh, closing thought from any of our uh, speakers? I would like to add a few words, Joe, if I may. Please. I think that uh, this is one of the most exciting uh, initiatives I've been a part of. And the reason is um, it's not it's not common to see NVIDIA sitting down with Intel, Marvel, and Sando AMD and, and deciding on things and agreeing on things. And if we can do that, any uh, of, of the members can do that. And I think we have also a great mix of different levels. As you've heard, we've got Red Hat, we've got Dell, we've got F5. So we actually have three different types of uh, industry leaders talking about three different types of problems. And I feel like we have a great mix and we would really want for each of these types to add more people. So it's definitely something that we're interested in doing. Please come and join us. Excellent. And we got one last question and we have, we have a couple of minutes. So the question is, because GraphQL has a playground and makes the makes life a lot easier for users and a lot easier to prepare APIs and only one endpoint, so it's more secure, is there any plan to look at GraphQL as um, part of the overall API structure? Anybody want to take a shot at that one? I personally very like GraphQL. We did consider it. We talked extensively about that. We do see that gRPC is dominating that space, uh, either from cloud providers, uh, interaction on the back end between different uh, uh, microservices. So this is why we chose to go with uh, gRPC, Google protobuf based direction. Uh, but definitely GraphQL was one of the choices for us to consider initially and just didn't make a cut. If you think differently, Come join our meetings, express uh, what is the best way. Maybe we're wrong and we're willing to change and adopt. Yeah, excellent answer. Thanks, Boris. Uh, anything else? 
All right. Well, thank you very much again for your time. Um, again, um, please rate the webcast, um, share the links. Um, we want participation. We want discussion. Um, you can come participate in STIA. Uh, you can come participate in OPI. So thank you very much. And with that, we are done.